Let's talk about what's buzzing around in the world of AI. Next week is NVIDIA's GTC. I will be in California at GTC, so if you're going, I might see you. NVIDIA is also giving away this RTX 4080 Super, or I should say me and NVIDIA are giving it away, and it's completely free to enter. So check the link in the description if you want to see a video on how you can get entered to win this bad boy. And right now, Sora is trending on Twitter, not just because OpenAI continuously releases more and more very, very impressive demos of Sora in action, just a straight text prompt to video, but also in a recent interview, OpenAI's CTO gives very vague and strange answers to the question about what data they used to train Sora. Before we get into it, I do indeed have a quick word from our sponsor. Let's be honest guys, as AI enthusiasts, we browse a lot of websites that aren't exactly well known. Hey, we're always checking out the most interesting new AI technology, whether it be from a small startup or sometimes even a completely unverified website. That's why I'm happy to say that today's video is sponsored by none other than NordVPN, yes, the best VPN in the business. If you go ahead and click the link down in the description below, NordVPN is offering just Matt VidPro viewers a special offer, four extra bonus months on top of their plan. For us AI tech enthusiasts, NordVPN covers a wide range of capabilities. First of all, connecting to NordVPN is dead simple. It's an automatic quick connect if it's installed on your device, and they've got over 5,300 servers in 60 different countries, meaning, and this happens a lot, if there's a certain AI product that is not yet available in your country and you want to use it, you can use NordVPN to tunnel through and connect to a country that does actually have access, thus allowing you to get access. And again, connecting to some of those, let's say, unverified AI sites, they have a double VPN for extra protection and automatic threat protection to ensure that any AI tools you might download on your own computer are safe. What's also really cool is NordVPN's entirely risk-free. If you don't like it, well, you don't have to pay for it. They have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, if you click the link down in the description below, you get four free months. Again, I really want to thank NordVPN for sponsoring because this channel would not be possible without its sponsors and, of course, the viewers watching. I promise you won't find a better VPN anywhere else. We'll go ahead and take a peek. What data was used to train Sora? We used publicly available data and licensed data. So, videos on YouTube? I'm actually not sure about that. Okay. Videos from Facebook, Instagram? You know, if they were publicly available, um, available, yeah, publicly available to use, um, there might be the data, but um, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not confident about it. What about Shutterstock? I know you guys have a deal with them. I'm, I'm just not going to go into the details of, of the data that was that was used, but it was publicly available or licensed data. Obviously, it's been one of the main concerns for AI lately. Legally, who owns the data that was used to train these models and how does the copyright work on that? The question definitely seems to make uh, the CETO, Mira Murati here very uncomfortable. People are pointing out that it's kind of concerning that she doesn't know where the data exactly came from, but I think you have to keep in mind that the way that they collect the data for these models is definitely not hand-picked. So it's probably some sort of web scraper that goes and grabs publicly available videos along with, you know, as mentioned, licensed data. This AI stuff is pretty new, so it would make sense that we don't really have a specific copyright law in regards to this. But since Sora is just for this internal research use, it does give them a little bit more leeway than if they were using Sora as, let's say, a product that we could all pay for and utilize. I think there's a high probability here that the CTO was nervous because in her mind maybe she thinks that the interviewer is attempting to pull a fast one and trick her into giving an answer that can be, you know, some big headline and get a lot of clicks for the Wall Street Journal. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know the legal circumstances on what kind of data you can use, but I'm sure that OpenAI has lawyers and wouldn't just go off to train a model without ensuring that they won't get absolutely destroyed in a lawsuit. But maybe I'm wrong. So now I want to dive into Anthropic AI's Claude 3 Haiku, which, while not as powerful as their best 
best brand new model, which coincidentally, in my opinion, is the best large language model you can have access to, is the fastest and most affordable model in its specific intelligence class. Here's the thing about Claude 3 Haiku. This model competes with GPT 3.5. Input tokens are a staggering half the price, while output tokens not so much at 125 in comparison to 150 on the GPT 3 side. What's cool though is it is better in every single use case or at least every single one of these benchmarks, especially in sectors like grade school math where we see an 88.9% on zero shot versus only a 57.1% on five shot with GPT 3.5. And not only that, this model has vision capabilities as well, meaning you can upload images to it and ask the AI questions about those images or use those images in creative ways where that's just not possible at all with GPT 3.5. There's no vision capability whatsoever with that model. For context, it also beats out Gemini 1.0 Pro in pretty much all of these benchmarks as well. The thing about Haiku though is that it is three times faster than its peers and they mentioned that this enables enterprises to quickly analyze large volumes of documents such as quarterly filings, contracts, or legal cases. And it's interesting that they list these as the examples because this is something that I don't know if I would feel comfortable trusting one of these smaller Haiku models with. However, perhaps Haiku has really good recall, just like its bigger brother models. Meaning, you know, if you upload lots and lots of documents, it's going to be able to analyze it without hallucination. So this also happened as well. OpenAI partnered with Figure to give this robot more or less a brain via API access to OpenAI models. And it also has vision capabilities as well via OpenAI, which is pretty darn cool. Figure more or less obviously has the robot itself here, but they also develop neural networks that are delivering fast, low-level, dexterous robot actions. And as you can see in this little video right here, well, this little bot has the ability to just put stuff away right in this basket or, you know, put some dishes away, all while having conversations with the user. And and obviously it can see when a task is complete because it has those open AI vision capabilities. So this right here, folks, is your closest glimpse or one of your closest glimpses at what the future is going to look like with robotics and AI combined. I think in the next 10 years or so, you're going to see some massive developments and improvements in regards to the combination of AI large language models, vision models, etc., and robotics. You're going to see robots working at different businesses. You're going to see robots inside of people's houses. You're going to see them driving people around for sure, except the cars themselves will be the robots more or less. I've been talking about this a lot lately and especially seeing all the autonomous AI agent stuff. I just think the combination of autonomy plus the robotics here is really something to behold. It's really going to bring some of that like futuristic sci-fi stuff to actual life right before your eyes. I can't even imagine what the world is going to look like in like 30 or 40 years. Just absolutely mind-blowing. Brett Attic here, who is the founder of this company, notes that there's no tricks with this video. It's all happening via neural networks and that the video is not sped up or edited in any way. He notes that they are approaching human speed with these robotics. Apparently, these cameras are feeding into a large vision language model by OpenAI. I don't know if it's GPT-4 Turbo or what. It's some sort of vision model. It could be even a new one that we haven't come across. Right now, the cameras that allow the robot to see are operating at 10 hertz, which honestly isn't too bad. Definitely enough to pick up a lot of what's going on. I don't know. You guys can think this is creepy or cool. It's probably a little bit of both in reality. So next up here, let's talk about Devin. I made a video on Devin yesterday. It's this autonomous AI agent and appearing from the videos that Cognition Labs uploaded of them testing and using Devin, it's the best AI agent we have ever seen to date. McKay Riggs here is not a part of Cognition and he got access, uploading a full 27 minute video of him using it in real time here on Twitter, which I'll link down below. He notes that it feels like the chat GPT moment for AI agents and that overall is just exceptional work from the Cognition team. Now, I can't really get the video to play personally right now, but like I said, it'll be linked down below and the fact that they're giving people access who are not a part of the team and who are just going to make, you know, some Twitter posts, they're not paid to review this 
this stuff, I think bodes well for how well Devin actually works as a real use case. I've also DM'd them to try to get access myself, so we'll see if I end up getting access because I'd really love to put this thing to the test. It's important to note, OpenAI probably has some GPT-5 on the way that hopefully will utilize autonomous agents, and I've said this before, I think that it has to utilize autonomous acting agents in order to keep up with the rest of the industry, as is clear with stuff like Devon. Anthropics Claude 3, Opus also has the ability to use AI agents. It's just not public yet, so we'll see how that works as well. It'll be a very, very interesting year, and I think it's going to be the year of AI agents. This also popped up on my feed, and I found it very interesting. This is Cartwheel. This is a text-to-animation AI tool, and as you can see from this little video demo, you can just text, and it will animate your character in whatever ways imaginable. I have a feeling this only works on human characters, right now because how could they, you know, abstract this for frogs or dogs or other kinds of creatures. Oh, and by the way, it's actually called Cartwheel. That's what this AI is called. Their system here is still in early access, as Andrew notes, who used to work at Google AI and OpenAI. This is pretty darn cool, though. This is walking on a tightrope and trying not to fall. And you can see it's able to animate this character in a very realistic way. I mean, it looks like you did mocap on someone, for sure. That's very impressive. But I bet it fails quite a lot right now. As you can see, any any character is really applicable to this. Practice boxing punches. Okay, wow. This could be a pretty big year for AI-assisted video game creation. Animations, sound effects, and coding with Devin. I also wanted to touch on Midjourney's character consistency here in this news video. Dogen Earl, fantastic AI account here on Twitter, by the way, shows off this example with Sydney Sweeney uploaded as the input character for the character consistency, and it does a pretty good job at replicating her in these various generated images. It's called character reference and there's a few ways you can use it. You just do dash dash CREF with the URL and then you can do dash dash CW to adjust how much strength from 0 to 100, 0 being the face only and then 100 being the full character. Emmanuel here on Twitter, which is also a fantastic person to follow for AI news, also happens to be the founder and CEO of Scenario.gg, which was very much working on consistent characters. Gave this a test run as well. He notes that he doesn't think it beats a good fully trained Laura model yet, especially when paired with IP adapter, showing off the comparison of the mid journey feature with the Laura and IP adapter and just Laura with no reference image. And honestly, I would have to say that these results are pretty telling. While I think the mid journey feature is absolutely a phenomenal start, it gets the blue skin, the pointy ears, the very bright yellow eyes, and the overall facial structure. It doesn't look like the same exact goblin creature as you see over here in the middle with the lore and IP adapter. I mean, this one I would say is pretty much perfect every single time, getting nearly all the same exact features. Eye shape is correct, the facial bone structure is correct every single time, and the skin color is just bang on. And you see Laura with no reference image is also really good as well, so it doesn't beat the traditional options, but it is a heck of a lot faster and easier to use than, you know, setting up a whole Laura. Of course, this will all be linked down below if you guys want to take a closer peek at this. I think it's really fascinating, though, and we're definitely going to see the era of consistent characters generated with AI this year. I can't wait till Stable Diffusion 3 releases as well, because this will just make all of this more coherent as well with your prompts. You'll really start to be able to use this for real-world scenarios. Also, something I wanted to touch on really quick, this week, Gemini 1.5 is becoming accessible to people. I actually got access, a few of my Discord members got access as well, sort of in this like early stage. Ruben Hasid here on Twitter notes that it is not a really great model for the high token limit that it is advertised up to. First test that he did was read Inception to write Inception 2, 50,000 tokens for the whole script, and it's good at setting an outline for 
a sequel to Inception, but eventually around the 13th chapter or so, it starts to fall apart and begins to hallucinate over time, meaning it's not very consistent with the amount of tokens that it can intake at once. So it's just really not all the way there, and while it seemed very impressive when Google announced it, it doesn't seem to have the chops to back itself up. I also tested it with some multimodal video, which it did okay at, but it just didn't have a level of clarity that got me really riled up or excited. Like, I literally sent it one of my own videos, and it did okay getting a synopsis out of the video, but it started to hallucinate some weird details. It wasn't all exactly as it happened in the video. And finally, everyone is sort of anticipating this OpenAI model release. Everyone on Twitter is really hyped about it, even though OpenAI hasn't really hinted at too much, but everyone's sort of expecting a GPT-5 because a year ago today, we saw the announcement of GPT-4. And GPT-4 was a really huge day. I even said happy birthday to GPT-4 because I think it was that important, honestly, to the world of AI. It was a model that was very far ahead and is still competitive a year later. And a year in the AI space is a very long time. So we'll see how things go. Again, I'm going to be at GTC next week and I'm going to be covering lots of AI announcements and cool AI tech that I might see there. So stay on the lookout for that and also enter to win that RTX 4080. Check out some of my recent videos and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.